gosh. Oh, hamstring. Up. <laughs> Sniper, take the other picture. Yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how you can formulate opinions without having true facts. I'm telling you. Think about it logically for just a second. Dear Reds fans. Welcome back to the Zebra Zillionaires. It was a tough one yesterday. Live from Chatterbox Sports Studios, it's Off the Bench with Tom Brenneman. Good morning, good morning. A pleasant good Tuesday morning. We welcome you to Off the Bench from our Chatterbox Sports Studios in downtown Hamilton, Ohio. We're presented by United Dairy Farmers. Lots going on today. We come your way Monday through Friday, 10 hey, hey. to 12. P. You can join us on YouTube, Chatterbox Sports. We broadcast live on X at Seabox Sports. Or you can download us in podcast form. Just search off the bench with Tom Brenneman and you're dialed in. Well, look, we knew this was coming sooner or later. After all, Brian Callahan and Lou Anarumo have been interviewed for head coaching jobs numerous times over the last two years. Callahan becomes the first to get his big break. And he was named head coach of the Tennessee Titans. They'll officially do it today. Congratulations to him. What an unbelievable honor. And it's worth noting that the Bengals will play the Titans in Nashville next season. So how will the dominoes start to fall with this move? Many believe Dan Pitcher, the quarterback's coach, will replace Callahan as the Bengals' offensive coordinator. Now, Pitcher is scheduled to have interviews this week, he's supposed to get on a plane tonight for an OC job interview. He has three of them lined up. New England, Las Vegas, New Orleans. Former star defensive back Jason McCourty speculated last night that T. Higgins would become a target for Callahan and the Titans. Now look, they can't sign him as an outright free agent. But might the Bengals tag him, sign him, trade him to Tennessee? We'll discuss all this with Charlie Goldsmith from Cincinnati.com at 1045. In a matter of moments, former Super Bowl winning head coach Brian Billick will join us to talk about what it's like when you are named a head coach in the National Football League. And we got the championship games, of course, this weekend. College Hoops, Cincinnati traveled to number seven Kansas last night with hopes of evening their Big 12 conference record at three and three. It did not happen. It was another tight one, like every game has been in college basketball's best conference. But at the end of the day, it's another loss, 74-69. The Cats turn it over 16 times. They shoot 16% from three-point range and went nearly seven minutes in the second half without a single point. Against most teams in the Big 12, that will not get it done. UC has lost four games this month by a total of 13 points. Next up, the Cats return to Fifth Third Arena Saturday, 7 o'clock tip against UCF. UCF beat Kansas earlier this year. Tonight, a big one for the X-Men as they hit the road, the first of back-to-back games against nationally ranked opponents. Tonight, it's in Omaha against number 17, Creighton. The Muskies have won three straight conference games. We rarely talk about the NBA, but worth noting, Joel Embiid became the ninth player in NBA history to score 70 points in a game, helping the Sixers beat San Antonio. He had 70 points and 18 rebounds. Then later in the night, this was one of the most bizarre things of all time. Former UK star Carl Anthony Towns scores 44 points in the first half. Then all of a sudden starts jacking up shots from everywhere. From everywhere, right? They end up losing the game. And Towns was benched in the fourth quarter for not playing team basketball. He finished with 62 points. All right, elsewhere in baseball, the Hall of Fame results will be released tonight. Adrian Beltre, a lock. Many feel like this is the year for Joe Maurer, Todd Helton, Billy Wagner, all a chance to get in. Among others, we'll know it's 6P tonight. And Aroldis Chapman is now a Pittsburgh Pirate. He signed a one-year, $10 million deal with a team last night pending a physical. Marty Brenneman will join us from the Reds' caravan at 11 o'clock. All right, let's get right to it. Brian Billick, Super Bowl winning head coach and our NFL insider on all things that are important in the NFL. 
Coach, good morning. Hope you're doing well on this Tuesday. You're looking sharp. Good morning. Hey, I got a question for you, and I'm sure you'll never forget this. You were offensive coordinator with the Minnesota Vikings. All of a sudden, you interview and bang, you're named the head coach of the Baltimore Ravens. Outside of the emotion, the thankfulness, the joy, the excitement, etc., in terms of order of business, what happens for Brian Callahan? He's going to be named the coach. What takes place immediately? It's it's amazing. It's amazing process because you go through this roller coaster of emotions. You worked your entire life to get this opportunity. You get it, and you go through the interview process, and you're very detailed. And this is how I'm going to do this, and this is how we're going to rally. This is how I'm going to build the team. This is how we're going to change the culture, and yada yada yada. And and then you get the job, and then you sit down at that desk for the very first time and go, "Holy crap! What do I do now?" Yeah. <laughs> You, it really does come cascading out. First order of business is he's going to make a beeline down to the senior bowl because that's primarily where you put your staff together. Yeah, that's the thing I did. I was immediately after the news conference announcing me, I was on a plane down to uh, to Mobile uh, at the time and and because uh, that's where all the coaches are. Uh, and you already have an idea of what, you know, what your main staff is going to be and you've already had those kind of conversations. But you finalize that and and you then fill in because there's other positions that you haven't gone that far down yet. Um, you you will interview likely or visit with guys on the existing staff uh, to give them some respect and say, OK, here's and there may be some of the, that you, uh, you want to keep on the staff. Marvin Lewis was the only one I kept from the previous staff, which obviously was a good hire. Um, and I had no Marvin, uh, when I hired him. Um, so, you know, the, all that process begins and then, and then you're back to, uh, to Nashville and it's, it's because you look up and the combines, what, three weeks away, four weeks away, once the senior bowl is done. Um, so you're, you're really scrambling around to get the coaches in place, going to get to the, uh, uh, combine coordinate with the existing and whatever is existing there in terms of the personnel department, regardless of what changes are going to be made after the draft and start coordinating that integration between personnel and, and your coaching staff. So there's uh, and you haven't even begun to talk about putting the playbook together and the X's and O's. I mean, it's, it's, it's fast and furious. All right. What about the decision? Cause ultimately I want to get to where the Bengals might be in making a decision to replace Callahan, but, 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 but bear with me here for a second. So you're talking about all of those things. If you're Brian Callahan, you never had a chance to call plays as an offensive coordinator in Cincinnati. Is one of the biggest decisions, or walk us through the decision that he's going to have to make as a head coach as to whether or not he's going to call plays. Yeah. Well, whether you're someone, uh, uh, you know, typically it's a coordinator that has called plays that gets a head job. And regardless of whether you have or not, you, one of your first fundamental decisions is, is am I, am I going to be a head coach that, that orchestrates and oversees everything? Or am I going to try to be the offensive coordinator as well? Uh, it's, it's an amazing process because when you're a coordinator and you're living it, it's 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, I mean, you are totally upset, but you're totally uh, integrated with it. And that's all you can think about. And then you get a head job and go, oh, and I'll do this other thing too, which is kind of silly. Uh, but... You, and, and different guys do it different ways. I started out uh, calling the plays, and then I relinquished to a coordinator, ended up taking it back. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and there's no right or wrong way. If he wants to be his own coordinator, having no experience calling in the NFL, I don't know if that's a limitation. He may very well decide, I'm going to get a coordinator in place, and I'll oversee it, but he's going to be more than coordinator in name and he's going to call the offense. So that's the first really big decision he has to make. And if he decides I'm going to be the coordinator and I am going to call it, then you got to find a, a very good number two that's going to be basically the quasi-head coach. I, I call it the 3 a.m. rule. When you wake up 3 a.m. in the morning, what are you thinking about? And if he's thinking about, do I put the fullback in the flat or do I run this and when do <laughs> I call that? You're the coordinator. Who's waking up at 3 a.m. thinking about personnel, thinking about practice structure, thinking about all those little details that you have to, as a head coach, you better have a strong right-hand man. If you're going to be waking up at three and thinking about what depth the Z is going to be on 22 Z in versus 
well, how, what's the practice structure? Where are our deficiency personnel? What's the draft? You know, there's a lot of other things. And, and to think that you could just do both is a fatal error. Okay. Uh, now, if you're sitting here in Cincinnati, Dan Pitcher has been the quarterback's coach since Joe Burrow was drafted. Obviously, he is very highly thought of around the National Football League. He's never been a coordinator, but he's got interviews lined up this week with three different teams I mentioned a moment ago. He's supposed to get on a plane, in fact, tonight to leave Cincinnati to go to Las Vegas. All right, now you're Mike Brown or Katie Blackburn, and here you have this guy who Joe Burrow speaks glowingly about. Clearly, uh, Zach Taylor has talked glowingly about, yet... Unless something changes, and you alluded this a minute ago, you would be getting the the, the coordinator's job in Cincinnati, but not being a play caller. So would you rather be in that position? I'm asking you personally. Would you rather be in the position of, okay, I got Joe Burrow, I got Jamar Chase, maybe I got T. Higgins, I got all these guys, right? But I'm not calling plays. Or... I have a chance to go New England, Raiders, Saints, where I will be the play caller. Is that a big part of the decision? If the money is equal in all of them, would that be a determining factor for you? Sure, Uh, but, but follow the path. You can make the case. Well, I just saw a coordinator in Cincinnati who is not called the place get a head job. So obviously that path, if he and and assumingly they think he's a good coach, he knows what he's stepping into. I'm assuming that that uh, Taylor's going to hold on to the play calling. He could make the case. Well, I stay in Cincinnati. I've got a great quarterback, and I just saw the guy above me take that path to a head coaching position. So you could you could see that and it would justify it. More traditionally would be well, if I really want to become a head coach, I got to go someplace where I do it all. Now, the places you just named, that'd be great, but none of them have a quarterback. So now you, you've got to weigh that mm-hmm. against, do I stay with Joe Burrow on a path that I just saw the guy in front of me get a head job, or do I go do the coordinator thing, earn my chops that way, but I got to do the 50-50 crapshoot of do we find a quarterback? Because if you don't, then you just become the, 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 the captain of a sinking ship and that path to a head coach isn't going to happen because you're not going to be very good as a coordinator. You're only as good as your quarterback is. So that's kind of the calculation he's going to have to look at as to ultimately, if indeed your your number one priority is what's my best path to becoming a head coach, the fact that you just saw the guy in front of you, I would think staying in Cincinnati would be a viable choice for him. Okay, but uh, now let's put, uh, put you in Zach Taylor's shoes. Um You know, like every coach, you know. I mean, heck, you used to listen to people burying you on the radio. I remember you telling me stories. You're driving home and your team just scores 45 points in a game. You're the coordinator in Minnesota, and they're they're lighting you up to get fired, right? Um, So if you're Zach Taylor, he's come under criticism like all do for his play calling. Uh, But he's come under a lot of criticism here in Cincinnati about his play calling. Um, Do you think he would be less reluctant, or you, if you were in his position, would you be less reluctant to think about giving up the play calling duties to a guy who has never done it before? In fact, he's never been a coordinator before. You know, it's it's interesting that dynamic of being a play caller, and it's I always find it interesting. Zach Taylor has taken his team to a Super Bowl and is great, but all of a sudden now he can't call plays. No, it doesn't work that way. And and frankly, actually physically calling the plays is is overblown. Yeah, you have to have a, a, a good offense and a good quarterback, and it has to be orchestrated. But and and all of us think we have a special intuition about play calling, and we don't. You just don't. Um, if 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 and if he needs to give it up, and he may very well be. You know, Mike Shanahan, you know, a lot of it is it's just fun. I mean, play calling is right. fun. You like it. Um, but at some point you recognize, you know what, I need to be more of just the head coach. I need to push that individual attention to detail to and, and, and embolden the right guy. If you really believe he's the guy that your quarterback coach is going to be the coordinator, can make the calls and make the plays. And, yeah, he'll he'll be as good as you are. 
because the game plan is orchestrated. You're going to have input on the game plan. And you all know what your first call is on first and 10, second and 10 after a run, second and 10 after an incompletion, second medium after a run, explosion on the, when you first get to the 40-yard line. What's my first call on the goal line? That's all orchestrated during the week. Who physically calls it is sometimes over-romanticized. So, yes, he may be at a point where I'm still going to oversee the offense just like I oversee the defense. I'm going to be the head coach, but I'm going to let him orchestrate the details. And that's probably not a bad idea uh, because there comes a point where, I mean, it's a lot and it can wear you out. And you probably need to bring a little more focus on the day-to-day of being that head coach, monitoring uh, what's going on with your team on a daily basis and let the minutia of the details offensively go to another guy, uh, but you're still going to be involved with it and still make the calls to a certain degree. So yes, that that's easily done and probably not a bad path to linger and hold on to, no, I'm going to do it. You know, like Mike McCarthy took it back in, in, uh, uh, in Dallas. Okay. And, and uh, the result was very good, but what did he give up as the head coach and why he was almost fired this year? So there is a give and take here, uh, mm-hmm. and some guys are good at it. And, and again, uh, Zach Taylor's going to have to decide whether this other guy is capable or not, and he likely is, uh, but he has to make that decision, and, and turning it over would not be a bad idea. Not because he's not a good play caller, but simply because through the maturation as a head coach in the organization, that's probably something you should do. All right, last thing I want to ask you about um, is this, because we discussed this a little bit yesterday. Knowing that Pitcher is so young, uh, he has not been a play caller. Uh, he clearly has been a part of putting the game plan together along with Callahan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's been argued that oftentimes it, it's good to bring in a quote-unquote fresh pair of eyes, right? I mean, the yes. Ravens this year bring in Todd Munkin from the University of Georgia. And they have just exploded under him. And that offense, they, they just got an unbelievable team. I don't need to tell you. Um, is, is, is this the situation with the Bengals where maybe they should consider that? What are the pros and cons of, yeah, we got a guy that our quarterback really likes. Yeah, he's worked with him every day. For every day he's been in the league. But then there's that chance that somebody else comes in here and they could put a whole different you know, light on this offense. Sure, and, and and that's a valid perception. Anytime you bring those fresh eyes, that fresh energy, that and, and it would energize the team. It would energize Joe Burrow, regardless of the relationship with this guy as a quarterback coach. That 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 can be true. The age thing is not a. I mean, we're in a right now. All the head coaches in the league. What are, if you've had lunch with Sean McVay or or uh, uh, Kyle Shanahan? Then you're 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 a candidate for a head coaching job. Um, the guy in the guy in Miami is what he's what 14, 15 years old. You know? right. I mean, right. this, this, is, this is the way of the NFL. Now. We want these young genius gurus to come in and and uh, uh, so yeah, it's a matter of what coach to bring in somebody from the outside, fresh fresh, fresh eyes is not a bad idea. You could still keep the existing guy, uh, make him the coordinator, and still bring then bring in a new quarterback coach or bring in somebody else off to bring that next perspective. That's not a bad way to go. You don't have to bring it in as the coordinator, um, uh, per se. So there's a lot of ways to accomplish what you're talking about. Okay. All right. Well, look, I don't want to take up any more of your time. We can talk about all the championship games this weekend. If you were picking the games this weekend, I mean, uh, the the Baltimore-Kansas City game. It's the last thing I'll ask you. I mean, goodness gracious. What a game that has a chance to be, right? Yeah. I mean, and and you're right. The Ravens are playing – lights out but it is Patrick Mahomes a big thing there and, and yeah at the end of the day uh, the Ravens are favored it's interesting they're only favored by, uh, favored by three and a half so you get three for being at home so really they're, they're favored by half a point which I find a little tight uh, as well as the Ravens have played the biggest factor to me where the Ravens where, where Kansas City could obviously with Mahomes and the defense is playing pretty good uh, Spagnuolo will have a good plan for Lamar the the fact that Kansas City is a physical running team now with Pacheco, that could they challenge, be one of the few teams that really do challenge because they've got to configure to take care of Mahomes and, and Pacheco get hot running the ball? That could happen. Uh, I'm not betting on it. I'm betting on the Ravens. 
But that unique combination of Kansas City coming in, that if if they win, it's going to be because Pacheco is and, and that line are running the ball well, and then Mahomes does four or five magic plays like he does. And and uh, and but the Ravens also, you know, the way they like to bring pressure, you got to. I always I joked about this on a show uh, uh, the, the other day. If I'm the, if I'm the head coach of the Baltimore Ravens, if I'm John Harbaugh, I go to is it McDonald or the defensive coordinator and go look. Yep. I don't care if we lose by fifty points. I do not want to see Travis Kelsey catch the ball. Okay, that's job one. That's that's that. Don't let Travis. Patrick Mahomes is going to do some things. And they got some other guys, but it amazes me how open Travis Kelsey still gets at key times. I don't care if you have to put three guys on him. I don't care what you got to do. Stop that guy, and then Lamar will run. Yeah. So there's there's a price to pay, but you cannot let Travis Kelsey beat you. And and that. So I'm going to be interested to see if Kelsey can get open, and if Pacheco can run the ball. If not, if either one of those things doesn't happen, then I think the Ram- the Ravens are a slam dunk. Okay, well, then I will ask you about the NFC game because, I mean, you know, Bill Walsh is one of your mentors. You worked for him uh, 100 years ago, uh, and you were out there in San Francisco. It's where you started your career, your coaching career. Um, I think the Lions have a chance in this game. I mean, it's a big duh. I mean, they're in the NFC championship game. But they do some things that uh, – that can give teams some fits. You, you think they have any chance out there in California? I would love to see that happen because, as we know, Detroit's the black hole. Things just go in there and disappear for <laughs> right. decades. Yeah, right. And the fact they're in the championship game, and this is a personal bias for me, only because I was at the Baltimore-Detroit game in Baltimore. They were inducting Terrell Suggs in the Ring of Honor. Baltimore just demo- I mean it was 30 well 38 to 6 and it was not that close right I can't get that image out of my mind as great as Joe Go- uh, 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 Goff Jared Goff has been going on the road to San Francisco now Purdy looked a little, little shaky you know early on but at the end I think the totality of that defense what they'll be able to do against the Detroit defense I just you know would be great I just don't see it happening. I think it's going to be Baltimore and, and San Francisco because um, that San Francisco team is pretty good. And even that game, I'm jumping ahead here, and they'll say, well, they they killed them uh, in, in San Francisco. Well, that's with five interceptions. This is a stupid thing to say, but if Purdy doesn't turn the ball over like he did against Baltimore the first time, they were moving the ball, and they were handling Baltimore pretty good. This, this, this could be a hell of a game. But I just, as much as I'd like to see it, and it's a great story, I just don't – see Detroit going west and San Francisco not playing well and and getting that done. Okay. All right. Coach, thanks for your time, my friend. Great to see you as always. Have a great rest of your day. Sounds good. All right. Head coach Brian Billick, Super Bowl champion with the Ravens. Will the Ravens be Super Bowl champions again? Brian won one there in Baltimore. Uh, John Harbaugh has already won one. He would be on track for number two if his team can get it done. But that is the game over the weekend. I mean, uh, they're both, obviously, they're conference mm-hmm. championship. Yeah, duh. But, man, the storylines involved there. I, I just love I want to get back because we're going to talk most today about this whole Brian Kelly. I thought that Coach Billick, that's why we're so fortunate to have him on mm-hmm. the show. Because his insight into this stuff of breaking down what are your decisions you have to make. Talk, I mean, I would have never thought in a million years, oh, we got to, all right, first thing, we got to get on a plane and get down there to the senior bowl, right? right. Then we got to get ready for the combine. And now you're thinking about your coaching staff. And, and you got to meet the people that you met in the job interview, but you don't know them. They're player personnel people, right? There are so many things going on there. Um, and congratulations to Brian Callahan. I mean, this guy has, has earned this job. He's worked his tail off. He's had great success working for a lot of different organizations, for a lot of phenomenal future Hall of Famer quarterbacks, mm-hmm. right? Good for him. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. That was uh, the, the biggest takeaway about this is, is at some point we knew based off of what you've seen in the history of the NFL is when a team is successful, teams start plucking pieces from that team, right? And we knew, based on what the Bengals have done over the last two years, that at some point, Lou Anarumo and Brian Callahan were going to get a head coaching job, as they deserve, as as every OC that, that's been to back-to-back AFC championships deserves. 
So yeah, this is this is this is absolutely well deserved. He 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 paid his time. He's still young. He's still exciting. He comes from a, a great coaching family. So yeah, I mean that that's the biggest takeaway here is that he absolutely deserves this. And I thought you had a really good uh, conversation with Coach Billick about all the things that happen once you get a head coaching job. And I and I think you alluded to it. But what was your biggest takeaway from what Coach Billick said about you know w when you get into a room and now you've got a you, you, they talk about a president, first 90 days, right? What are your first 90 days as the head coach of the Tennessee yep. Titans? What was your biggest takeaway, Coach? Well, I mean, it just, it's got to be so overwhelming. I yeah. mean, it's so much on your plate instantly at one time. Now, Brian Callahan's been preparing himself for this happening. He's interviewed multiple right. times. I'm sure he's thought through this entire process many, many times. But when it actually happens, I mean, with anybody out there, when you get that first Big break, right? I mean, the big one, right? You're all of a sudden going, oh, my God. I mean, you know, my, my job was 10,000 you know, degrees below a uh, head coaching job. But I remember when I got the Chicago Cubs job as a 25-year-old guy. It's a big job. Yeah. I mean, that's when Cable was coast to coast. They were one of two teams in America that were on from coast to coast. I don't know a soul in that town. I have no, where to, no idea where to live in that town. I don't know anybody who works for the team. I don't know anybody. And all of a sudden, I got to go drive up to Chicago and start looking around. And look, I'm not alone. All of you have done this at one point in time or another, whatever it is you do. And to now all of a sudden be responsible. I mean, I was only responsible for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to go out and hire 20 coaches. Right? Right? to be my assistant to the assistant to the assistant, right? I didn't have to learn 65 or, you know, how many you got between the active roster, um, who your potential free agents are, mm -hmm. uh, consulting with your player personnel people about who you want to bring back, how much money do we have under the cap, what are we able to spend, what are our needs, what do you guys think our needs are? I mean, can you imagine what that is like for him? I mean, good for him, he's going to make a lot of money, but right. there's a lot going on. Yeah, that's certainly not a responsibility that I want to want on my shoulders. No. I, oh, sure you would. You'd love it. You'd love it. Come on. Everybody would want that responsibility. I would love the job. I don't know if I'd like the responsibility. That's that's the catch-22 of having <laughs> a big-time job, right? It's a lot of pressure. It is. It's a lot of pressure. No, I, I, I'm happy for Brian. I think eventually, like Reed said, one of these guys, at least one of them, we're going to get snatched away from us. That's, that's what happens when you're a successful franchise in the NFL or when you're a successful team, when you have a run. But I feel like this is a good, good time to part ways. Um, and, again, I, I, obviously, <laughs> obviously the, the window is <laughs> no, problem, Casey. Right, no problem. Thank you. right through the camera. This isn't going to do it, Casey. Uh, right. This is wild. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I feel like this was a good time to part ways. I, I feel like, and, again, this is the – <laughs> so keep going. <laughs> There's a charging block right there, There's, Tom. Right, right next to this green box over here. This green box over here. If you need a charging here we go. block, on the ground. Here so we go. Good. Yep, there we go. We're doing it all today here on yep. off the bench. What was your point, Elliot? Yeah, let's try to get back to that. I think it's a good time to part ways with Brian Callen. I, I'm not going to say it's the closing of a window. It's just the start of a new one, right? I, I think you're going to lose Tyler Boyd. You might lose Mixon. I think there's a good chance uh, T. Higgins does not uh, play next season for the Bengals. I think the tag and trade is a very real possibility. And with that, I think Brian Callahan potentially and, and, and Brian, and Brian Can Callahan seems at least – at this moment, to be a good fit for the Titans. So, I, I listen, I, I'm, happy, I'm happy for the Titans. I'm happy for Brian Brown. Yeah, I'm absolutely happy for him, too. Listen, this is the, – the, the biggest question, and, and, and Tom alluded to it, is, is what all falls into place from here going forward, right? Yeah. Is Dan Pitcher gone, who everyone assumes, everyone here in Cincinnati is assuming that's going to be the next offensive coordinator of, uh, of the Cincinnati Bengals? Well – now a guy that he's spent a lot of time with over the last few years has gotten a head coaching job, and he needs an OC. Hey, you know, we, 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 I would love your brain down here in Nashville, right? I would love where we've got a young quarterback. We're going to try and get this right. So where do the pieces fall going forward here in Cincinnati? Where do they fall for Brian Callahan down in Tennessee? All of these things are <laughs> – it, it, it's, it's going to be – 
so I'm so curious to see what happens here. I said yesterday on Chatterbox Bengals that this is perhaps out of all of the question marks that the Cincinnati Bengals have going forward. Where dude with, with T Higgins, Tyler Boyd, DJ Reader, Awuzie, uh, Jonah Williams, all of these holes that are on this team. This is perhaps the the one that they most need to get right. If they get a bad OC, and he's not going to be calling plays, but if they get a bad OC that they can't help um, collaborate to, to scheme guys open, then the opportunity to do the things that the Cincinnati Bengals want to do going forward shrink significantly. So you have to get this right. Dan Pitcher, if he is the OC, he has to be the right hire. Yep. Has to be. Well, you know, the question becomes, and we're going to get into this with Charlie Goldsmith from Cincinnati.com here in about um, – about 15 minutes. But we're going to find out, I think, how much the Bengals think of Dan Pitcher mm-hmm. in the next few hours. I agree. Because this is one of those situations, Casey, where he's been around. Zach Taylor has spoken very highly of him. Very highly. He has been here since the day Joe Burrow was drafted. He has been Joe Burrow's only professional quarterbacks coach. He has worked hand-in-hand with Brian Callahan, with Zach Taylor and others, putting together a game plan every single week. I think Pitcher was elevated in others' eyes even more. What happened after Burrow got hurt and Jake Browning took over? Mm Mm-hmm. And the team went four and three. And, you know, outside of that very first game against Pittsburgh, uh, really both games against Pittsburgh, but in the other games, they performed quite well. Certainly better than a lot of, pe- of us expected. Um, but don't you think we're going to find out what the Bengals really think of Dan Pitcher? Because if he gets on the plane tonight, which we understand he is supposed to do, to begin a series, three of them, Saints, not in any particular order. Saints, Raiders, Patriots. If he gets on that plane tonight, well, now you're rolling the dice that some team might overwhelm him and just say, here's the job, here's the money, and he sits there, and I've done it myself. Only time in my life where I walked in and somebody said to me, here's the job, right now, take it or leave it. You got to move across the country right now. Make the decision. I mean, do the Bengals let him get on that plane or get that deal done today? I mean, personally, I think if they are in on Dan Pitcher, they should probably get him to agree to something before he gets on that plane. I really do think that uh, they think highly of him because he's been around since the Marvin Lewis era. I mean, he came in in 2016, and he's stuck around even through a whole staff change. Uh, Zach Taylor really likes him. Um, obviously, the owners ownership really likes him as well. Otherwise, they wouldn't have kept him around for that whole entire staff change. So that being said, I, they also extended him last year before uh, the offseason. He had a couple of interviews, one of them with Tampa Bay. I think that was a very legitimate um, candidate candidacy spot for him, and they decided to extend him to keep him around here. So the plan was already to keep him around for the next OC job, to, uh, for that to be opened up, and then for him to just fill in. I think we all see that. So but you the think fact, they but, get it done today? I, I think they should get it done. But the fact that there's rumors that he wants to call plays, and that's a big part of the, the deal for him, for him to be able to call the plays – I just don't know. Like it would, it would require that conversation that we had about Zach Taylor earlier on in the season, saying, "All right, Zach, you're done calling plays," and that conversation probably just does not go over very well. I, I don't, I don't think there's a, a world in which Zach Taylor's not calling plays next year. Um, I, I thought Coach Billick had a really good point about it. Kind of echoed the sentiments that I had, and it, it feels like a tired take whenever fans are like. Man, the play calling is just so terrible. But sometimes it is true, right? Like some, the reason that we, we listen to those arguments is because sometimes, yeah, the play calling is yep. bad. Um, Tom, I'm, I'm interested in you. We're talking about Dan Pitcher. Me and Casey talked about it last night. And one thing that I want, I think it's so important, whenever you're building something, 
to get someone from the outside to have f- fresh eyes on it, right? right? Yep. I think that is so important, collaboration, because when you, when you just keep hiring from within, you get locked into the way that you were doing things, right? This is the kind of the argument that I had against uh, uh, Gerard Mayo becoming the head coach of, of the New England Patriots. It's like you're, you're, hire, you're, you're firing Bill Belichick, and then you're just going to hire – another version of him right. like what, what what are you trying to accomplish there so i think it's so important to constantly be getting new ideas constantly be bringing in new voices and new eyes onto something and say hey you come from a different perspective than what we've been doing over the past three years what do you think we could be doing here on the offense that's why i like i'm not opposed to hiring dan pitcher but i would i i would prefer someone from the outside to come in here and say listen this is what was successful at the place i was just at this is what we do. Someone like uh, who is the the OC or the, the not the OC, but someone so, from Miami, right? Yeah, the um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I had a whole list of guys that we went through yesterday, but the passing game coordinator for Miami is open. He, he's open to deal um, right now. We, we could we could have him here in Cincinnati probably tomorrow. Uh, and you just look at what he was able to do with Tyree Kill and how explosive that offense was. We all know that. Tua is probably not the guy either, and he still made that offense look great. He still protected Tua. All those things, I think, you take into consideration and you say, well, they were able to make Tua look fantastic this season and last year. Our offense looks a little stale, at least in the passing department. Let's, let's bring him in and see what he can do to help alleviate some of the pressure on Joe Burrow. Okay, but here would be my question. Why are they letting him go? They're not he, letting him go. He, he's just the passing game coordinator. He's just interviewing other getting, places. You're just saying he's getting interviews. Yeah. Okay. All right. So they're granting him interviews as a passing game coordinator. Well, just moments ago, story breaking now. I mean, you want to talk about night and day in terms of philosophy. And, I, and I'm not going to say anybody's right or anybody's wrong. But if you want to compare organizational philosophy, ownership philosophy, you have the Bengals and you have the Philadelphia Eagles. Mm-hmm. The Eagles lost both their offensive coordinator and their defensive coordinator to head coaching jobs last year after the Eagles went to the Super Bowl. So they bring in brand new guys, right? They start with a DC, they're unhappy, they demote him, they promote Matt Patricia, longtime guy under Bill Belichick, right? Apparently, both of those guys are out the door tomorrow. The Eagles just announced moments ago their offensive coordinator brought in for one year. Now, hear me out for a second, okay? Hear me out for one second. Listen to some of these numbers. We know the Eagles collapsed over the second half. They went one and six. But when it comes to some of these offensive numbers, let's just take a look. They had a step back this year. There's no question about that. But how dramatic was their step back? They went from 28 points a game to 26 points a game. Third in the league to seventh in the league. They had a top seven scoring offense. They went from ninth in the league passing to 16th in the league passing yards per game. And they went from fifth in rushing to eighth. So they had a top seven scoring team. They had a top eight rushing team, and they were in the top half of the league in passing yards per game. Offensive coordinator, out. So now all of a sudden that job's open. Apparently they've scheduled a news conference for tomorrow, they the Eagles, where their outstanding, and I mean outstanding, general manager, Howie Roseman is going to sit down with head coach Sirianni. There was a lot of talk about Sirianni being in trouble. Apparently, they're going to tell everybody, no, that ain't the deal. He's not in trouble. But we're making some changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine something like that, Elliot, ever happening around here? They stayed here with a head coach who I give him all the credit in the world. He turned around the worst operation in football, the laughingstock of football. But he was here for 15 years, had a 500 record, never won a playoff game. And I think that's where 
I don't want to use a small market in terms of uh, when we're talking about the NFL because it's different. There's salary caps. It's more fair. It's more equal. But it is more of a small market town, and I think there's there's loyalty built here. The 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 pressure, if you will, um, the expectations aren't as as nearly as high as in Philadelphia, and I and I think that's evident when they when you fire your offensive and defensive coordinator back to back years, or you lose them both in back to back seasons. So I I. I couldn't imagine it. I can't imagine the pressure these coaches feel when you enter a big market, when you enter a big city like that where, where a fan base is rabid. Uh, I, for, for, for the Bengals, I think, and again, I'm not expecting them to go out and fire guys left and right after one down season. And when you look at the Eagles, you say it's a down season, um, but it wasn't really. So they had, they, had a, they had a very good year. It didn't end well. Clearly, there was something going on in that locker room. I think that was evident. Mm-hmm. I think I think if you listen to the New Heights podcast with uh, with the Kelsey brothers, I think I think Jason alluded to it. Um, but I, I, I'll, I'll say this: if if the Bengals start doing that, I'm not going to jump for joy. I don't think that's necessarily the right way to go. Since the start of the 2022 season, Tom, every team in the NFL has changed offensive coordinators. That's two years ago. That is two full seasons, yep. and since then, all 32 teams have changed offensive coordinators, and that was the – Brian Callahan was the one holdover since then. So this is the new age NFL. Listen, uh, as for the Eagles thing, I, I was pro them getting rid of Nick Sirianni, and everyone co- thought that was crazy. Obviously, they're going to stay with them. I think what happened in Philadelphia in the second half of the year is the worst instance of coaching that I've seen perhaps in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. It, it truly is because that team was – the best team in the NFL for 20 out of the 21 weeks last year up until the Super Bowl. Philadelphia Eagles looked unstoppable. For the first 11 weeks of this year, they looked unstoppable. And then they're not even competitive. Something just flips a switch, and they're not even competitive. They, they played the wor- I, I thought they played the worst out of any team in the postseason. Yep. All 14 teams that made the postseason. I thought by far they, by far they had the worst performance. Um, so this isn't surprising to me. This isn't surprising to me at all. Um, after, after what happened in the second half of the Philadelphia Eagles season, something had to change. Something had to change. I'm surprised it wasn't Nick Sirianni in all sincerity. Well, the point is, as it change. started this conversation, was just the difference in philosophy. What do you want to see out of your organization? Right. Okay, and I'd be curious if you would feel that way if you actually worked in Philadelphia and lived there and had to talk to the fan base every sure. day. I mean, you know, we, we don't know. Uh, we all get overwhelmed with the news and the people and the personalities and everybody involved when we live in a particular town and you're just beaten over the head with information about that team morning, noon, and night, right? I mean, we don't know anything about Johnson, the coordinator in Philadelphia. I don't know anything about him. I mean, you know, he got the job for a reason. I know what Matt Patricia's done in his career. Now he's out. So, but when you look here, You know, do you want to see more of that? Do you want to see Zach Taylor, Mike Brown, Katie Blackburn, Troy Blackburn, Duke Tobin, Zach Taylor? Do you want to see them open their minds to the possibility that there might be somebody else who's not under your umbrella that could improve weaknesses from this past year's team because there were many? If you think Dan Pitcher is the best guy, amen. They know. They know. But are you just going that route because it's the easy route? Mm. Are you going that route? Here's the thing that would concern me the most. Is when you let players start to run decisions. Okay? Because, look, I I, I don't blame Joe Burrow one single bit if he's going to go to bat for Dan Pitcher. He sits in the meeting room with this guy morning, noon, and night, Mm -hmm. week after week, month after month, day after day. They've developed a phenomenal relationship. Burrow has great respect for him. But for Burrow, it's a comfort level. He knows this guy, okay? He knows the things that Pitcher might say to him. Does Pitcher challenge him? Does Taylor challenge him? I don't know the answer to those questions. I have no idea. But what we do know is if somebody came in from the outside 
Now all of a sudden you're starting all over. It's not like Joe Burrow's getting benched. But you are starting an entirely new relationship and foundation as opposed to what you were comfortable with. Does being comfortable mean it's better, a better decision? Does going outside the box and outside the organization and bringing in somebody else like the Ravens did this year and look the way that's paid off with Todd Munkin, would that help improve the Bengals on offense? This is a big decision for this team. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you do bring in somebody else, and this is a part we'll talk with Charlie Goldsmith here in a minute, and you heard Brian Billick just say it, Who wants to go be an offensive coordinator? And I'm taking Dan Pitcher out of it because of what Brian just said. He saw the guy in front of him just get the job. But if you're a guy that is like a Munkin, and I just keep using him as an example because he's been an incredible hire. He was getting paid a gazillion dollars by Kirby Smart at the University of Georgia and led them to -to back-to-back national championships as their offensive coordinator with Stetson Bennett at quarterback. Okay, the Ravens bring him in, and look what happened. Pretty good, pretty good. So let's, let, let's ask Charlie Goldsmith about some of this from Cincinnati.com. Charlie, good morning. Thanks for your morning. time today, my friend. Hope all's well. Hey, uh, nobody's surprised by the Callahan news, and I think everybody's very excited for him. He seems like a good guy. Uh, you've been around him quite a bit. And I don't think there's any doubt that he's ready for a head coaching job, right? So here's kind of the best Brian Callahan story I've got. Back-to-back seasons now, he's kind of predicted how the year was going to go for the Bengals, uh, kind of from an X's and O's schematic way. Uh, Before 2020, 2022, I'm talking to him, I ask, what's the story of the year going to be for Joe Burrow? And he says his timing, his knowledge, when to check it down, his balance between big game hunting and taking the smart, efficient play That ended up being the story of the year for Joe Burrow. Then last year, I asked in June, what's the story of the season going to be? And he said it's going to be the evolution under center, the balance between the under center and the shotgun looks that the Bengals provide, and the way they're going to be able to be more creative and flexible from a a game plan specific basis. Of course, they couldn't do that in September due to the calf injury. But then in October, when the Bengals really hit their stride, it's exactly what happened. He has a very good uh, uh, feel for where offenses and defenses are trending. And more importantly, too, like he knew where I was at from an X's and O's perspective. And he explained these things to me in a, in a way that was very much at my level. And, of course, my level is not as high as Joe Burrow's level, obviously. Uh, he, he's good at explaining it at that level, at, you know, Andre Yoshivash's level, and at every level in between because of who he's at, as a, because of who he is as a communicator. Well, I mean, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, I'm really glad you made that point about he took the time to talk to you. And, and, and pardon this, this term, but it, it, it certainly applies to me when I've been in those situations. They dumb it down for you, right? I mean, they really do. They dumb it down a little bit. Um, but, you know, now you're in the situation, and, and we'll move on from Callahan because now he's gone. Okay, I mean, even though it's new news or not even news, it's old news because Bengal fans are wondering, okay, what's next? Now, you've reported, you know, Dan Pitcher's supposed to be going on these interviews, Raiders, Saints, Patriots. As of this morning, now the Eagles job is open. I got to believe somebody's calling Dan Pitcher's agent as we speak about the possibility of getting him an interview. Would you suspect that the Bengals will not let pitcher get on that plane tonight and sign him today do you think that's going to happen I think that's their priority I think there's that that's ideally what would happen I think for both sides involved but Zach Taylor has publicly said already like there's an interview process that they have to go through that's how these systems are working across the league there are rules in place xyz check this check this check this off Dan Pitcher has more than proven that he's ready to be an offensive coordinator. We know this because he pulled himself out of the Buccaneers race last year um, when he would have had a chance, you know, run their offense and be the guy calling plays, running the show with Baker Mayfield in Tampa Bay this year. He pulled himself out because he valued the opportunity uh, of being in the Joe Burrow pipeline, of being in the Zach Taylor pipeline because of the expectation that Callahan will get a job eventually. So, All of those signs suggest to 
pitcher's number one choice being the Bengals, the Bengals' number one choice being pitcher. But then, of course, you're not doing your due diligence, and also you're not following the rules. If you you know make him your, your OC today, there are things that have to happen before you can get to that point. Okay, well, um, make an argument for me, Charlie, uh, and I'm not asking you necessarily to believe this or what you would do, but we've been talking on the show today with Brian Billick, uh, the, 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 the five of us in here, about, you know, maybe it's not a bad idea at this point in time, let Pitcher go do his interviews. You're rolling the dice a little bit. Um, but to maybe look outside the organization, and we keep making reference to what the Ravens did, say, with Todd Munkin this year. Make an argument for me why that would make sense. It's what I could see Zach Taylor least doing. Um, okay. and, and I could do that. But the biggest difference between Todd Munkin and Zach Taylor is it's not John Harbaugh's offense. It's now Todd Munkin's offense. Right. Regardless of who the offensive coordinator is going to be, Zach Taylor and Joe Burrow will have more say over this offense than the offensive coordinator. It's funny, too, like if you were going to hire an external OC, it is truly incredible how many of the hot offensive coordinator names on this cycle have a connection to Zach Taylor. I've got a list to my left here. Liam Cohen uh, coached with Zach in L.A. and Zach, like they talk often. Uh, Zach brought him to Paycor this year to hang out. Uh, Clint Kubiak worked with Zach at Texas A&M and they like got into coaching together. Cliff Kingsbury played with Zach, coached with Zach very early, one of his closest friends. Jake Peets played with Zach at Nebraska, and Jared Johnson played for Zach at Texas A&M. So if it is the external hire, everything that Zach Taylor has suggested would signal that it would be a guy he has a, a pre-existing relationship and similar set of philosophies with like Callahan because I think what – would make least sense for Burrow. And, you know, Zach wants to keep running this offense going forward would be just a sudden change when that's not as much needed because when Burrow was healthy, the offense was still elite. All right. Uh, We're going to see how all this plays out uh, very quickly because, uh, you know, look, uh, at the end of the day, if the Bengals think as highly of pitcher as you hear, uh, Burrow talk about him, Taylor talk about him, the second you let him get on the plane, even though you have to conduct other interviews, I mean, look, we understand how this, this whole thing works, right? You've got the Rooney rule, and it's a great rule, and it's an important rule. I don't think there's any dispute about that. But, you know, look, you can say to pitcher, hey, di- look, you've been here. This is your gig. I know people don't like hearing this, but this stuff happens. It is what it is. And this had to have anything to do with a black or white or Hispanic or anything else issue out there. This has to do with a guy that you've seen his work, his work ethic, the results, ready for the next step, has been a a Bengals guy, has been in your franchise for a long time. He has earned the right to get this job. So, I mean, is it possible uh, with with all those things in mind, Charlie, that, that they do get it done, but we don't know that they get it done? I I don't know. I really don't know. Again, what I do know is, They love pitcher. Burrow loves pitcher. It's funny. He had all this momentum entering the season. And then Jake Browning, you know, Zach Taylor said, was like pitcher's finest work yet and really added to his OC case even more. So, again, I see it going in that direction. I think Troy Walters is a great candidate as well. He has a very unique feel for having a quarterback perspective as a guy who was a star wide receiver. Uh, Troy Walters has been the red zone guy and done an incredible job with some huge specifically designed plays for some big moments and two-point conversions and all that kind of stuff. He's an important name to mention as well. As far as the timing, frankly, you know, I don't have a ton of information on that right now. Okay. All right. All right. I heard you were a big hit at the Reds' caravan. Is that true? Where were you? I was in the back. I don't know. I, I, that, I don't know who your sources are on this. I would say I was not much I of got a, a lot of sources, Charlie. I got a lot of them. I mean, most of them are like me. They're has-beens and wannabes, but they're still around. And I heard you were a big hit. I wasn't working the crowd like Brent Suter. That guy knows how to make an yes, introduction. He does. He does. Where, where, where were you? What was it like? I mean, I was just, they had the, the event at the Spooky Nook, which is a big facility in Hamilton. It was Suter. It was three top prospects. There were a couple hundred people there. It was a huge nice. turnout, a, a great energy, a great crowd. You know, I got the chance to, to talk to some of the prospects who I hadn't seen in a while, um, which was, you know, what I got the most out of it. That was a, a really – you know, good opportunity to catch up. Um, there's a lot of buzz right now. People are excited about baseball season. No doubt about it. Well, you'll be, uh, you'll be busy, 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 as you always are, Charlie. So thanks so much for the time, and thanks for joining us on Late Notice. Appreciate everything. Good to see you.
All right, Charlie Goldsmith, kind enough to join us from Cincinnati.com. I mean, you texted me right away last night. We had to get Charlie on the show. That's right. We That's had right. to get him on. And uh, we stuff. got the Hall of Famer, Marty Brenneman, coming up in about two minutes. Casey, take the ad read. I'll be right back, and we'll get to Marty Brenneman. Okay. The, uh, the, on- <laughs> the uh, Bengals and Bearcats report is brought to you by Encore Technologies. Encore Technologies provides IT solutions for a data center in the world. With the suite of services from mobile computing to desktop to data center, supporting both centralized and work-from-home computing modules to improve efficiency and... Productivity. 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 Visit Encore.tech. The path to innovation begins here. And let me tell you about this lovely bottle of water right here. Pawnee Water. Made right here in Hamilton, Ohio. Uses natural limestone filtration, unlike the artificial processing other brands use. The result is a healthy alkaline water, and some say the best tasting water in the world. Visit Pawnee Water at P-A-H-H-N-I water.com. See where you can buy this great tasting water. Drink lots of coffee from UDF. Swish it down with some Pawnee Water. Mm. And get your technology solutions from Encore. Reed, do you have anything you want to add uh, on no, to that? No, just Pawnee Water's great. UDF's great. All of our Encore technologies, they're, they're all great. Um, if you haven't already, please give us a like on the stream. We appreciate it. There's about a couple hundred people in here. Um, subscribe to the channel. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the chat, but did you hear the news about our UC Bearcats football squad? What's the, what's the news? Tyson Veidt Whoa. is the new defensive coordinator for the Bearcats. Wow. Now, that name might not mean a lot to you, but he was the head coach of the Bluffton Beavers when I was a freshman. Really? Yeah. What has he been doing since? He was uh, the linebacker's coach for Iowa State. He was like uh, assistant coach of the year in the Big 12 okay. a couple times. Okay. What maybe, about that? Maybe he can help the Bearcats win one game. From Deion Sanders being the head coach yeah. to now the Bluffton Beavers' former coach. And it should have been Deion. D- they really should have went out being and got D.C. Him. He wanted to be here in Cincinnati. I, I think that was evident. That one guy at that basketball game last year who wore a shirt that said, Deion, come to Cincinnati. I'm surprised that didn't work. So now that the Bearcats got Tyson Veidt, yeah. former Bluffton Beaver. Oh, yeah. I think the radio booth needs a former Bluffton Beaver. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay, kick Danny, oh. Danny H. out there. Yeah, that would be an elite You're, idea. Who, yeah. who, who would you have in there in the booth? Uh, when you think of famous Bluffton Beaver alums that are, that are in the yeah. media, you think of guys like uh, Tyler Avila. Sure. You think of, That's of, a name I know. Of, yeah, and he's the program director at the 92.5 The Frog up in Lima, Ohio. <laughs> the Frog. Of Ribbit. course. You got to do that. Ribbit. Um, that's just the first name that comes to mind. But Bluffton Beaver, former head coach, now the D.C. of the Bearcats. Let's, let's hope the Bearcats can get two wins next year. <laughs> let's, get, let's get wild. Set. Big set. Doesn't have quite the ring as Cal does, does it? <laughs> set. Set. No, All sad. Right. Let's, uh, let's get to Marty. Marty Brenham in the Hall of Famer is standing by. I thought you were already on the caravan today. Good morning. Good morning. No, uh, they, they, this is the second year in a row that they've done it uh, somewhat differently, which I think is a great idea. They have different groups go out on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, mm. and I think Thursday. I'm not sure. But you go out, like in my case, I'm going out tomorrow morning. I'll be gone from tomorrow morning until Thursday night, and we and my 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 uh, my leg uh, goes to Evansville uh, to the Hard Rock Casino there um, tomorrow, and then we come back to Bloomington. We spend the night in Bloomington tomorrow night, and then we do the big mall in Indianapolis with other stops in between schools and sure. such things as that, elementary schools and radio stations. Uh, in between, we'll do the big, uh, and then we'll end, climax it with the uh, ball appearance in Indianapolis on late late Thursday afternoon, and then come on back to Cincinnati. Well, it's nice you get to stop in Bloomington. Maybe you'll see your grandson tomorrow night. Well, my plan is to see Luke tomorrow night. I, unfortunately, we don't get in there until between 8.30 and 9, but hopefully we can work that out and I can uh, check in with him. Yeah. Now, when you're going to a casino, will a guy like you, we have a couple of people in the chat, Drew Garrison wants to know, will you find a way to sort of sneak off and, uh, and, and get in a little blackjack, something like that? You know, you uh, having been my son for 
Look, these are coming years. from the people. These are coming from the it people. It really Not surprises me. me that you would waste my time and you would waste your time <laughs> with asking a clownish question like that because Marty does a lot of things, but Gamble ain't one of them. Okay. Well, I, look, I'm just trying to serve our audience. That's all I'm trying I understand to that. I think okay. you made that up, though. That's too quick for some guy to tune in. It is sitting and here right gonna... here. Drew Garrison, get Marty out oh, on oh. a blackjack table. He Right here in the chat, he asked it, and I'm just sharing. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about a couple things. Hall of Fame tonight, the writers vote. Um, slam dunk Adrian Beltre. Um, are you I surprised? So. Well, he's a slam dunk. I mean, he'll get well, not hope even he is. Yeah. yeah, he is. He is. I mean, yeah. okay. of the early ballots that have been released, he's on like 99%. Of course, there has to be that one guy. There has to be that's that correct. one guy. That, 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 and that's sure the case hell for is. those that don't know. You know, the Baseball yep. Writers Association of America, for some strange reason, takes incredible pride in the fact that not Henry Aaron, not Willie Mays, not Babe Ruth, not Lou Gehrig, not one guy, not Ted Williams, has ever been a unanimous selection for the Hall of Fame. Can you think of anything more pitiful than that? Well, it's a damn joke is what it is. It really and is. It, it's it's real. It's really a slam against the fact that this body will not let any uh, – you get me on a soapbox now because I've preached this for years. I don't give uh, rats, you know what, what they think about me. I'm out of the – I didn't think about them when I was in the business. And I have great respect for many of them who I think are incredibly gifted. I think Trent Rosecrans is a great, great writer, a guy who digs up through research – things to write about that nobody has ever even thought about. And and I, I can go down the list of, of, of great writers. At the same time as a body, um, I think broadcasters from top to bottom see more baseball over the course of any given season than the individual writers who are members. Uh, they're guys that are members of the Baseball Writers Association that are charged with the responsibility of voting for Hall of Fame people who might not see a dozen games a year. I mean, it's a joke is what it is. And and on top of that, I still maintain until somebody can prove me differently that all the names that you just mentioned, Tom, and there are a whole bunch more, um, give me a valid reason why you would not vote for any of those guys as, as unanimous first ballot Hall of Famers unless, unless they personally pissed you off about something related to your job. You wouldn't give them an interview or – you spoke nasty to him one time. Uh, I, I just don't understand how anybody can give me a valid argument for why a Babe Ruth, a Ted Williams, a Lou Gehrig, a Henry Aaron, a Willie Mays, any of those guys were not first ballot unanimous Hall of well, Famers. You know I what? don't I, understand. My friend Reed Mouse here has corrected me because I had forgotten, and uh, shame on me. Actually, it happened with Mariano Rivera. So I stand. Okay, that's yeah, right. That, I did not realize. I read that, that the other. I, I read that the that. other so day. Reed, thank you. Yeah. He, I mean, okay. But, but, that's but, but, one. Look, the point is. Okay. The point is, all those guys you just mentioned, to have it go on that long, and even since then, I mean, the year after Mariano Rivera, who who well look, he was the best closer of all time. But, but let's no just, question. I mean, but let's just be honest here for a second, okay? He was pitching one inning per game in the games that he was pitching at, okay? We're not talking about the guys that, that were slugging through nine innings in 162 games a year and all this kind of thing. The year after Mariano Rivera got 100%, Derek Jeter did not get 100%. Derek Jeter. So, all right. Thank you very much, by the way, Reed, for that. You're welcome. I had totally forgotten about that, so I stand totally corrected. All right. Let's thanks, to, Reed. Yes, thanks, Reed is right. Thank you. All right. Um, but, but, but the other guys in the Hall of Fame, are you surprised that um, Joe Maurer, because right now on the ballots that have been released publicly, he is getting huge numbers. For the Hall right. of Fame, does that does that surprise you at all? 
I know you didn't see a lot yeah, of the little... Twins through the years, but I mean, you know, you got the Todd Heltons on there. You got the Billy Wagners on there. You got the Gary Sheffields on there, who doesn't look like he's getting much run here again. Yeah. Uh, and that's that a, a joke. surprise you with Bauer? Mauer? Yeah. yeah, a little bit. It does. And again, I agree with the, the approach that you take. I, we, we, we saw, I don't, I don't know that I maybe maybe there was I don't know whether I did games in which uh, Mauer was uh, played in whether the I don't recollect when the Reds played you know Minnesota when he was still a member of their ball club uh, that we were a broadcast party to but uh, yeah uh, you mentioned Sheffield I think it's a joke I mean a slam dunk open and shut but I thought Dave Parker should be in the Hall of Fame and I still maintain that the drug thing back in the late 70s or early 80s, whenever it was, is still coming back to haunt him. Um, and I think that's wrong because, you know, he survived it. Uh, it, it you turn the page on it, it's over with. Uh, and I think that's keeping him out of the Hall of Fame. But Sheffield, uh, we speak about the current names. I, I don't know how you can make an argument to keep him out of the Hall of Fame. But I read an interesting piece on The Athletic yesterday that involved, uh, I think, Jason Stark and Kenny Rosenthal, and I'm trying to remember who the third writer was, and talking about their approach to the Hall of Fame ballots and how the analytic part of it now comes into play that will enhance chances for guys who got less than two thousand, uh, less than 3,000 hits, uh, or some less than 2,000 hits that are being looked at differently. Chase Utley is probably the best example of how Chase Utley may well be a Hall of Famer one day. I don't think he got, I think he got 1,800 and some hits or 1,900 and some hits. Um, but but the other things that he uh, did to enhance the teams that he played for chances of being successful, uh, using all the analytical, uh, you know, the, I don't know what you call them, war and all that other stuff. Yeah. Um, that that will open the door for a lot of guys who never heretofore had had an opportunity or a chance to be in the Hall of Fame, whereas in the old days, before analytics, it was home runs and RBIs and batting average and runs scored and stolen bases, et cetera, et cetera. Now there's a different set of, of, of mathematical equations that will open the door for other guys to get in the Hall of Fame. Um I don't, I don't know. You know, the game's well, passed me by to that extent. I readily admit that. I'm not arguing uh, for or against. I just say that this is something that's basically totally alien to me, and and uh, I'll have to bone up even more, although I don't have any reason to because I'm not voting for him anyway. Here's the thing, though, okay? And, and look, uh, analytics has a place. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I don't buy into this war thing uh, because here's what I say to myself. Okay, I mean, you mentioned Dave Parker. Okay, just for, just for uh, fun, l- l- let's do this. Parker had 2,000 more at-bats than Joe Maurer. Okay? Right. Joe Maurer in his career hit 143 home runs. There are guys that hit that many home runs in five years now. Okay? He had 143 home runs. He did not knock in 1,000 runs. He knocked in 923 runs, okay? Dave Parker, compared to the 143, hit 339 home runs. Maurer knocks in 900 runs. Parker knocks in 1,500 runs, okay? On-base percentage, Maurer a little bit better. Slugging percentage, Parker better. OPS, basically a wash. Here's the thing. If you went, and you know and I know, if you went to any general manager in Major League Baseball that is old enough to have watched Dave Parker play and watch Joe Maurer play, and this is no knock on Joe Maurer, and you said you could have one or the other over a 10- to 12-year career, which one do you want? It It would be 100 to nothing based on arm, defense. I mean, Mauer was having concussions. They had to change in positions. He had a couple years there where he played 40, 50 games. Parker 
was the most dominant player for a decade in the entire National League. There isn't yep. one person alive that would pick Joe Ma- – oh, by the way, you're wondering about batting average? Dave Parker, with almost 350 home runs, was a career 290 batter. Maurer was 306. I mean – what? How many years did how, how many years did Maurer play? Not very long. He only had and six. Parker, six. I mean, he did he, not play very long at all. Joe he, uh, he came to the big leagues in 2000, really full-time player in 2005. But listen to these seasons and games played. 109, 138, 82, 113, 120. He had one year in his career where he had over 150 games. He was a catcher. You want to go look at Dave Parker? Not later in his career. He wasn't a catcher very long at all. He wasn't a catcher his it final four base. years of the league. That's right. Final four and years. One so of those years as a catcher. And the one year was the year. Look at, look, you want to talk about a Hall of Fame catcher who played every day? Go look at Pudge Rodriguez and go look at Yadier Molina. They I, played every correct. day. So I don't want to hear about Maurer. Look at these games played by Parker in his career. 148, 159, 148, 158, 139. Had the drug thing. Came back. 144, 156, 160, 162, 153, 144, 157. I mean, are you kidding me? And he was the best defensive right fielder with the best arm in the game. There was nothing he couldn't do. And the big, and when you, the, you just made the point right there. The guy played virtually every day, uh, and I'm sure with all those years where he played one, say, 148 plus, uh, 150 plus, he played days that would, other players would not have been in the lineup. Uh, it, there's just no valid reason other than you're going to hold that drug thing against him for all time and never allow him to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, and, and Joe Maurer's numbers, uh, for me, uh, God bless him, and I know he's a fine young man uh, and represented Minnesota and yep. the Twins to the nth degree. Joe Maurer's numbers do not dictate him being in baseball's Hall of Fame. No, they don't. And, and I and, think and, you're going to see the numbers go down. Uh, you're going to see the, the, the prerequisites or the things that had been acceptable in the past or seriously considering a player to be Hall of Fame caliber, those numbers are going to come down to the point where you're going to, and analytics is going to have a whole lot to do with this because those big home run numbers and RBI numbers and playing every day don't mean a damn thing anymore after a while. I just think in the long run, baseball's Hall of Fame, which has been the most hallowed of them all, more so than football, more so than basketball, it stood alone as a preeminent Hall of Fame of any sport in the world. Those numbers are going to drop, and you're going to have guys that have no business being in baseball's Hall of Fame. Joe Maurer had one season in his big league career, one season where he hit more than 13 home runs in a year. He had one. He did not have a single season where he drove in 100 runs. Not one. And that's a Hall of Famer because of on-base percentage? Are you kidding me? Look at his numbers compared to Gary Sheffield. Gary Sheffield hit 509 home runs. 509! He's got a higher (laughs) war than Joe Maurer. He's got more hits than Joe Maurer. His batting average is the same as Joe Maurer. He has nearly double the number of runs batted in as Joe Maurer. Are you kidding me? He's a catcher, guys. He, he gets graded on a curve. Catching's the, the, the worst offensive position on the field historically. You don't compare his numbers to Gary Sheffield. You compare his numbers to guys like Ted Simmons, guys like Mickey Cochran. Is Ted Simmons in the Hall of Fame? Yes. Yes. And, 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 and you, you yeah. want to compare his numbers to Ted Simmons? Well, that's, that's a fair, more fair comparison than Gary Sheffield. That's no, a it's more not, because what, Dave, you are asked to do, what you're asked to do here is you are asked to vote here. And, 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 and look, you even if you Mariano want to compare Rivera him to Ted Simmons, to Steve Carlton. if you want to compare him to Ted Simmons, he's not in the same league with Ted Simmons. 
Ted Simmons hit 250 home runs. He knocked in 1,400 runs. His batting average in a career was the same, basically, as Joe Mauer's was 20 points higher. His on-base percentage was 20 50 points, points higher. Yeah, Joe Mauer batted 305. Ted Simmons batted 286. That's 21 points higher. Okay, All right, so so there's your difference between the one cat hitting home runs and knocking in. So so the 1400 RBIs compared okay, to 900. Okay, okay. 900. Joe Mauer had a higher slugging percentage than Ted Simmons. So he had better power numbers too. Uh, so okay, so you you're telling me his on base percentage was 50 points higher. And Ted Simmons' war is roughly the same. It's five points less. It's correct. So, I mean, that, that tells you so much about that stat. I mean, come on. I mean, look, here, in total disagreement with what you're saying, this is a situation where you have a chance to sit down and you need to fill in a box on which 10 guys you're going to vote for for the Hall of Fame. If Joe Maurer goes in the Hall of Fame just based on numbers, and who you would rather have on your... I'll say the same thing about Sheffield. Mauer wasn't some Pudge Rodriguez, Yadier Molina defensive catcher. He was never one of those guys. He was good, no. but he wasn't those guys. Now, you're going to put him in, you're going to put him in on his offense. And his prime, yeah, That's what I'm saying. That's what they're voting on. And if they, if they view his offensive numbers as good enough to be in the Hall of Fame, Compared with all the other catchers that have gone in before him, something is wrong. Because they're not going to put him in on his defensive ability when you compare him to the people that you just mentioned a moment ago. Molina, who will, he'll be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, Pudge Rodriguez, uh, Johnny Bench, got, of course, Bench had the whole package. Uh, Yogi Berra, blah, 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 blah. But not Joe Maurer. We're going to put, we're going to put Joe Maurer in there because of his defense. No, you're not. Because he, defensively, he might have been okay. He wasn't great. Well, all right. We'll throw it around the room here a little bit and see what else uh, anybody has um, uh, on their mind. And, and, and I guess Nick Kirby, I don't understand what this, what this is here. Is that batting average? I mean, Joe Maurer, Mike Piazza, and Buster Posey are the only three catchers who caught 900 games with a 300-plus batting average since World War II. Okay, that's fine. Okay, big yeah. deal. Big deal. That's right. Big deal. That's big deal is right. I mean, if you want to yeah. carry them to other catchers – there, no contest between him and Piazza. And you and none. No. Okay, Posey's career wasn't as long and he's hurt a lot. Okay? But, I mean, come on. If you've got these other guys coming up for Hall of Fame, the Yadier Molinas of the world, and all these other guys, the Pudge Rodriguez already in, I mean, give me a break. There's not a general manager out there that would take Joe Maurer ahead of Pudge Rodriguez in his time or Yadier Molina in his time. They wouldn't take him. No. Wouldn't take him. Based on the entire package, on what you're getting, a guy who is able to catch, catch every day, produce on defense, produce enough on offense. Maurer was a better offensive player than Molina, but he wasn't available like Molina was available. All right, let's go around the room. All right, Reed, we start with you. Uh, I, think yeah. I, already, I think I already spoke my piece. Here's the thing about Joe Maurer, and I already said this. You guys are comparing his stats, and Kirby just threw this in the chat. You guys are comparing Joe Maurer's stats to outfielders, and that's not a fair comparison. And he said you should be comparing, like, stats of Carlos Beltran to Dave Parker and Gary Sheffield. That's more of a fair thing. Catching, I think that Joe Maurer, and listen, I'm a lot younger than you guys. So when I grew up, Joe Maurer, I played catcher. He was the best catcher in the league when I was growing up. He was the MVP. He was a three-time uh, gold glove winner. He was like a five-time silver slugger. He was the best catcher of the late 2000s. So when I look at all the other catchers that are in the Hall of Fame, yeah, he's not Johnny Bench. Yeah, he's not Yogi Berra. Yeah, he, he doesn't have the same offensive numbers as Mike Piazza. But, like, I already threw I, – I, I don't – Looking at the stats, I never watched Ted Simmons play. I never watched Ted Simmons play. But the stats are pretty similar. Similar in hits, better batting average, more slugging percentage for Joe Maurer over the course of his career. Uh, guys like uh, Mickey Cochran. Mickey Cochran, who played back in the 1930s, played for 10 years. He was fantastic at that time. But Joe Maurer has more stats than Mickey Cochran. Has better stats. So I guess I don't have a question. I guess I'm just arguing for why Joe, ba Joe Maurer isn't a Hall of Famer. But see, I we don't. We, we pick our spots, Dad. Tell me if you agree, if you want to play this game about you're comparing them position-wise. Because if that was true, if that was true, 
David Concepcion would have been in the Hall of Fame 20 years ago when compared to right. the other statistics of shortstops that are in the Hall of Fame. It's embarrassing comparing his statistics to the overwhelming majority of shortstops that are in the Hall of Fame, and he doesn't even get a sniff. So, nope. you know, to all of a sudden pick and choose what year we're going to compare positions and all these kinds. The bottom line is, if you were asked who was a Hall of Famer, the numbers I just gave you, and you had to pick two of the three, and who would you want on your team tomorrow? If I gave you Gary Sheffield, Dave Parker, Joe Maurer, Maurer would finish a distant third. Yes. I distant agree with third. that. No, I mean, not anybody yeah. who watched either one of those two cats play. I mean, it, it, it's not even debatable okay. who you would take. Unless, of course... You're a Joe Maurer fan, and you grew up in Minnesota, and I don't want this to be the beat-up Joe Maurer hour because I'm happy for the guy if he makes it. Good for That's him. right. Exactly. Casey, uh, anything from Marty Brenneman today? Uh, no, not, nothing to add on to these conversations at all. Nothing at all? <laughs> nothing at all. All right. All right. Elliot, I know that you have something. Yeah, that was scary, guys. You guys scared me just then. I was sitting here. I was watching you guys all lay out your points. I don't know who to believe anymore. Um, but, Marty, speaking of Hall of Famers, Alex Blandino, uh, he's, in, he's in AAA right now, and I think, or AA, one of the A's. And, and he's basically, I don't know if you saw this report, but he is working on a knuckleball. Uh, that is at least the report I saw on X.com yesterday. Former infielder, but I guess he's now trying to pitch, working on a knuckleball. How relevant is, and, and again, maybe this is just uh, my lack of, uh, really, it's my lack of age. I haven't, I haven't grown up with a lot of knuckleballers, R.A. Dickey is the last one I really remember. How effective in today's game do you think a knuckleball could be? Well, I think a, a knuckleball would be very effective in the game today, simply because everybody up there from uh, 6 feet 5, 230 pounds, to 5'8", 155, 60 pounds, trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark. Yeah. I, I think it would be very, 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 very effective today. One, because, um, <laughs> excuse me, I don't think you have anybody throwing one today. Um, uh, secondly, uh, as I said, guys are swinging out of their butts to try and hit the ball in the upper deck, and it makes no difference whether you're a, a slight of bill shortstop or a behemoth physically in the outfield or first base. So I think I think I give Alex Blandino a lot of credit. Liked him when he was with the Reds. Nice young man, uh, trying to forge a new career as a pitcher by uh, perfecting the knuckleball, which puts no stress at all on your shoulder or elbow. And uh, God bless him. I hope he can uh, get through it and and uh, surface with a big league ball club as a, as a pitcher. I agree. I agree. Uh, Marty, what are your thoughts? And, again, this is I, – I see this on Twitter, too, all the time, and I know you guys just were, were talking about it. When you see guys – post out their their hall of fame their hall of fame ballots and it's and, and i don't mean to be disrespectful to any of them but you know they're mostly the older guys they're the guys that you know the, the hard-nosed baseball fans baseball writers of america whatever it is i see them submit these ballots and they'll use only like one vote do you think it's a waste to only use one of one of one vote on one guy when you submit these things i think or, they should be they, they should have their voting rights taken away from them i agree i mean if they go, they're gonna make a stand by not voting for anybody or voting for one out. You know, I, I don't have a problem. You know, you can vote up to, to, to for 10 players, right? Yeah. Um, if, a, if a guy on a given year uh, who has a good track record for voting looks at the ballot and says, I don't think there are but six guys on there that are quality and deserving of a Hall of Fame vote, then I'm good with that. I don't have a problem with that. I don't think you – because you can vote up to 10, I don't think you have to. But to be – uh, to 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 look at a ballot, and we're talking about this year's maybe, and say, you know, there's only one guy who should be in the Hall of Fame, and mm -hmm. you need to re re rethink what your criteria is for guys that are qualified in your estimation to get a Hall of Fame ballot vote, or you ought to get the hell off of it. Is the way I look at it. I, I agree. I just I have the issue with, and again, if you, I'm not, I don't want to force writers to vote for everybody. I'm not saying that this isn't the NBA Hall of Fame. This isn't the NFL Hall of Fame, where a lot of guys, it's a lot of popularity, uh, and a lot of and a lot of guys just get to go in for free. But I, right. I, I will I will say this: when you have a vote and, and, and you put it out on social media, you share it, and you're almost bragging that you're you're going out of your way not to vote for people. That's what I have issue with. I think it's I think it's nonsense. 
I think it's strange. Well, but- I think I, I, going Go back to the top of the program, uh, when I came on and Tom mentioned Adrian Beltre, there's no way on God's earth, when you look at his body of work, that you can say, you know, I'm going to vote for 10 guys, but he ain't one of them. Yeah. Well, then there is a personal reason why you're not voting for Adrian Beltre. Uh, I don't get you can't do it. You can't reinforce or, or you can't make an argument uh, based on numbers, uh, based on longevity to keep Adrian Beltre off the ballot. So then there's another reason why he's not on your ballot. I admire the guys that make their ballots public uh, because if there is a glaring omission, then they're willing to argue that omission and tell you why they didn't vote for whoever that player might be. The guys that don't vote for guys like Beltre, and they don't have the you know what to yeah. make their vote their vote their ballot pub, uh, public, then I that's something wrong with that. I mean, I know Trent made his uh, public uh, maybe the same day uh, on the athletic or on uh, Instagram, whatever it was that he made his uh, Twitter. He made his ballot known as soon as he, he filled it out and submitted it. And I have respect for guys that do that because they're not hiding behind the fact that they're not going to submit their ballot for public consumption because they're afraid of the kickback that they're going to get from fans because you left Joe Blow off the ballot. That's a good point. That's a good point. And my last point, Marty, uh, I, I know you said you're not a gambler, but I'll tell you what. A lot of people this side of the Mississippi are calling me the best gambler to ever walk the planet. So if you oh want to hit, why would God. that be? Why yeah. would that be? Well, because I'm hot, Marty. Last night, you, I don't know if you've heard it. It's going all around the world. I gave out one pick on our show last night, and it hit. So a lot of people are calling me the greatest gambler this side of the Mississippi. But I'm, my point being, if you go to the casino tonight, uh, Tom can give you my contact information. We'll go run a roulette wheel for about three or four hours. Yeah, you, you'll be doing it by yourself because <laughs> okay. I won't be that. I'd, I'd rather watch the grass grow than watch you play the roulette wheel. Okay, and there ain't no grass growing right now, Matt, Jack. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Dad, thanks for the time. A lot of fun. Safe travels out on the caravan starting tomorrow. Okay, bud. We'll be talking to you. All right. Be good. Have fun in Bloomington, Indiana. Hopefully you get to see Lukey Man up there. I hope right, so. that, that was spirited. Yes, it was. It I was lo- spirited. That was, the, that was the most passionate I've seen you, Tom. I, I just I, I get so worked up because, fellas, look, here's the deal. I'm no better than anybody else. I, I'm, and I don't view myself as any better on anything than anybody else. I respect everybody else's opinion, okay? But I also have been fortunate enough to literally cover a baseball team mm-hmm. for 31 seasons. I see and have seen for longer than that because I was around it as a kid. Mm -hmm. I see what these guys go through in their career and fouling a ball off your foot the night before, getting in after a 17-inning game somewhere at 4 o'clock in the morning. They're back in the lineup the next day. People in the chat, you know, you're making comments about Dave Parker and cocaine. What, 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 when do you let it go? The man's dying right now. And and that's what we get. That's what you think of the great Dave Parker. Or that's what somebody takes into consideration when they're going to vote him for the Hall of Fame. And I think that's a I different- mean, I saw Gary Sheffield. This guy was a hitting machine. 500 I- bombs. He's in his last year of eligibility. And you're going to put in a guy, and it's, again, it's nothing against Joe Maurer. You're going to keep Gary Sheffield, 290-whatever career batter, 16, 1,700 runs batted in. Over 500 career home runs. You're keeping him out of the Hall of Fame? And now he'll drift off into Never Never Land, the Veterans Committee? I don't think a lot of people understand what this means to somebody. You might think you understand, and again, 
I'm no better than anybody else. But I saw it firsthand with Ron Santo. And I've told this story a thousand times. This guy should have been in the Hall of Fame 35, 40 years ago. No. Writers held stuff against him. Compare his numbers if that's a game you want to play with other third basemen. Okay? Which most voters, they don't do that. But they'll pick their spot like they are with Mauer this year. But they won't do it with the, the Ron Santos for 35 years on the ballot. They don't do it to Davey Concepcion, how many years on the ballot. They don't do it to Dave Parker, how many years on the ballot. They don't do it with Gary Sheffield, how many years on the ballot. But they're going to pick their guy. And this year, that guy is Mauer. I watched Ron Santo, who his numbers are right there outside of the Mike Schmitz and the Eddie Matthews, right there with anybody. Any of them. Every year, his name was up. No, 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 no. This guy was a diabetic. As an 18-year-old, gets to the big leagues at 19, plays every single day. He never missed games. Played his ass off. As tough as they come. And brought it every day. He gets told no. For 35, 40 years. Nope, not good enough. You're not good enough. He dies. And then guess what? Now all of a sudden, he's good enough. Are the voters going to let that happen to Dave Parker? Are they going to let that happen to anybody who's old enough in this chat to have watched Dave Parker play? He was the single most intimidating, powerful force in the game of baseball for a decade. There are many of you that are old enough to remember, and it might be the only Dave Parker highlight you'll remember. The all-star game when he unleashes that cannon of an arm from right field to throw out a runner at third base. This guy's career was up here, went to the bottom on the drug thing. He came back up again and nearly won an MVP for his hometown Reds. And today he's a sick man. Now, I'm not sitting here comparing in any form or fashion Joe Maurer and, and, and whether he belongs in the Hall of Fame or not. I'm not going to do that drill. But when you got Gary Sheffield and Dave Parker waiting to get in the Hall of Fame with those numbers, and if you watched them play, who would you take? I, I, have, a, I have a hard what? time understanding what in the hell is going on. This is Maurer's first year on the ballot. First? Are you telling me Joe Maurer is a first ballot Hall of Famer? I am surprised. I, he won't get in, first off. I mean, he's currently, he's currently sitting with 83%. That gets half, him in. Well, it, with half the vote. What happened typic, typically is all the younger voters, they put their ballots out. They show what they vote for. You don't have to. It's, it it, it could be an anonymous process. So only half of the votes are in right now. Um, typically what happens with the, with the anonymous voters are they don't vote for a whole lot of people. So 83% with Joe, ba with Joe Maurer, he'll probably end up with like 69, 68%. He won't get in this year. Adrian Beltre will probably be the only guy that get in. I'll maybe. bet you money Maurer gets in. This year? Based on what I'm reading. Well, he would have to get at least like 65% of uh, the anonymous votes, and I just don't know if he gets that. I follow the Hall of Fame voting very, very closely every single year because I, I, I don't know why. I love, I love stats and all this stuff. Um, the point – that I wanted to to bring up about Gary Sheffield is, is isn't the reason that Gary Sheffield isn't voted for because he's been linked to steroids? Nothing's ever been proven on that. Well, nothing's ever been proven on no, but I mean he's not even guys. been it's not even been nearly the level of all those other guys who were in that group. And the, what's crazy is is David Ortiz got in, and David Ortiz was the only one that failed a steroid drug test. That's exactly right. Uh, Barry Bond, Sammy Sosa, all of those guys, Mark McGuire, they never failed a drug test. Now, they clearly took steroids. Now, they clearly did everything. But Big, but Big Poppy actually failed a drug test, and they let him in. 
I, I have a question, and again, this is maybe this, especially in this town, this debate will come up. When you when you when you're trying to nominate people for the Hall of Fame, when you're trying to induct people into the Baseball Hall of Fame, yeah. The, there, there's two sides. But there's the analytical, statistical side that Reed brings up, and then there's the character side. Why does the char- – it feels like to me, and again, maybe I'm wrong on this, it seems like the character side of this has such a heavy part, and I don't right. think it should, right? It's a, it's a sham. It's the, it really – the character thing got thrown out the window in all seriousness. So they, they, there's a clause on who they vote for, and it says like that they uphold the game and character thing. And it got thrown out the window in all, sin- in all sincerity the very first induction class that they threw in because they put in a guy like Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb is one of the greatest baseball players the world will ever see. Yep. But the guy, he's, he's about as bad as a person. Like From all the stories you hear about Ty Cobb, there's a story that he beat up a cripple he walked off a field and beat up a cripple in the stands because the cripple was was heckling him. Ty Cobb is part of the reason that uh, African Americans weren't allowed in the game. He is part of the reason of that, and we let Ty Cobb into the Hall of Fame. So it is a sham anytime. Like, they don't let Kurt Schilling in because they don't agree with his politics. That's right. That is an absolute sham. That's right. That is a sham that they don't let Kurt Schilling in. Do I agree with the things that Kurt Schilling says? Absolutely not. If you guys know the things that I allude to, absolutely not. I do not agree with almost everything that Kurt Schilling says. But the fact that they won't let him in a museum that is dedicated to honoring the greatest baseball players the world has ever seen, that is an absolute sham. Because no one was a better competitor than Kurt Schilling. No one breathed the game of baseball more than Kurt Schilling. So that is absolutely preposterous well see look look and and this is tied into what elliot asked my dad well, you know about it being a popularity contest the selectivity occurs when it comes to the character right of the popularity of the player i always used to be amazed everybody and his brother knew jose canseco was roided up i mean if you were old enough and around right. to watch them and mcguire that whole oakland team damn near they look like a bodybuilding team right and yet every year, Jose Canseco, Barry Bonds, in the fan balloting, they would always be number one in the league. Yep. Number one in the league. It's all so selective. David Ortiz is the perfect example. He is this lovable figure. Everyone loves Seems him, Seems like right? a great dude. Mm-hmm. Smiles a lot. He's fun. Mm-hmm. He's done incredible stuff for charity. He's all those things. And so... Because he became a popular figure and helped lead the Boston Red Sox to their first World Series title in a gazillion years and helped them to three of them, all of a sudden it's okay to put him in, despite the fact that he was a proven PED user. That cannot be disputed. This isn't Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire stuff. Failed a drug test. This is proven that Ortiz did when he was with Minnesota before he came to Boston and became a great player, okay? Nick Kirby asked a question. He says, are there really 10 players on the current ballot that you'd even vote ahead of Joe Maurer? Even if you think he's overrated, you get to vote for 10. It gets back to the question you asked earlier. I don't think you have to vote for 10 because I don't think there are 10 that are on the ballot this year that deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. There aren't 10 guys that are there. My, my question here is, and what I'm saying here is, how can you look yourself in the mirror and put in some of the guys they're putting in while these other guys are just completely being left in the dust, like chasing the wind? I just I say to myself, first ballot Hall of Famer? It's surprising. It really is. I thought he'd get in, but I can't believe he would get in on the first ballot. And I still don't think he will get in on the first ballot. Um, the, only, the other thing that, I, that you and your dad talked about that I disagree with when it comes to the Hall of Fame, and I hear it thrown around a lot, and it is if we let these guys in into the most prestigious Hall of Fame, then that dilutes it, right? Like if you let, like, right. let guys like uh, Joe Maurer, you hear this from time to time, Harold, Harold Baines got in a couple years ago. <laughs> Come on here. Um, so – if you look at some of the guys that are in the Hall of Fame from when it started, 
the dilution started a long time ago. Like, I looked up catchers that are in the Hall of Fame right now. There's a guy named Ray Schalk. Do you know who Ray Schalk is? He was voted into the Hall of Fame. These are his career stats. You ready? 1,300 hits, 11 home runs, 500 RBIs, 253 hitter. Got in as a catcher back in the 60s, back in the 50s. Okay, but he was probably a dead ball era guy, right? He played, I believe, in the 50s. He was like on the, that uh, Pirates team. Okay, very when, different game. I, you know, I wasn't around for any of that. I, you know, I, 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 I hear you. I hear you. So that's, well, I guess he, let me see. He, he did play actually in the dead ball from the, the 1910s to yeah, the 1930s. Yeah, so I mean, that's, it's a whole different era. They didn't even have, they didn't even have fences in the outfield back in those But days. like, with even, even in that, they batted, like guys consistently batted 400. Ty Cobbs, Nap LaHoy's batted 400. This guy batted 250. In the dead ball era, when everyone's batting 350, and he's put in the Hall of Fame, another guy, Roger Breshanan. He's in the Hall of Fame. Never heard of him before. So the idea that letting in these, these different era guys is going to dilute, it, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily grounded in any base of reality because there's already guys in the Hall of Fame that don't deserve to be there. Harold Baines does not deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, Tom. I have 3,000 hits and 500 bombs, buddy. You got two hands that you can count up cats that have done that. Harold Baines did not get 3,000 hits. Sure about that? Pretty sure. I'll look it up. All right, take a look. Harold Baines, 2,800. All right, 2,800. How many home runs? Uh, 384. Okay, 384. Yeah. So, like, well. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I so mean, you I mean, you know, I hear you. Dave Parker, and Dave Parker certainly has a better moniker because he was a feared hitter. This is why guys like uh, Jim Rice got in. He had this, like, so, like most feared hitter of the '70s, Jim Rice's stats aren't aren't exactly to the to the level of of other outfielders and other sluggers that got in the Hall of Fame. But you know he's a, he's a phenomenal player. Now Dave Parker, I looked up his stats, Tom. You would you you would want Dave Parker in, and I don't have a I don't have an opinion on whether Dave Parker deserves to be in or not. But what about a guy like Moises Alou? Because their stats are are very similar. Same amount of home runs. Moises Alou had a better batting average, better on base percentage, better slugging percentage. Now he did have 600 less hits, but he also had 2,000 less at bats. Yeah. yeah. So you've you well, argued I think that's hard where for Dave. Yeah, I think that's where you have to you have to ask yourself the question. And look, it, it, the ages vary so much on the people who actually vote. So it's so, sort of unfair to ask them to be able to do this, but they can do their due diligence and talk to people that were around at the time. I watched Moise Salou from the day he walked into the big leagues with the Montreal Expos. Mm -hmm. I watched him his entire career. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable hitter. No doubt about it. Gamer, tough. First year in the big leagues, snapped one of the worst, one of the worst injuries ever seen on a baseball field is when he shattered his ankle running around a base into multiple pieces and came back and was still an outstanding player. If you were to talk to people and I would be one of them, who watched Moise Salou his entire career. And I was a guy who was old enough to remember Dave Parker his entire career. Regardless of what the numbers say, not even close. Not even close. Parker was the best defender, was the best right fielder in the game, mm -hmm. best arm in the game. Alou was a good defensive player, but after that injury to his ankle, he was never the same runner again. He didn't move like he did when he came up. And that's not his fault. But Alou was always top maybe 15 outfielder in his league when he came during his, most mm -hmm. of his career. He would never be in that top 7, 8, 10, 12. Parker, for a solid 10 to 15 years, was top four in his league as an outfielder. All-around player. Yeah. That's what's uh... – when you argue guys that, that get into the Hall of Fame, sometimes you, you, you talk about peaks, right? Like, how were, were they the best player in the game at some point? Like, because when people right. start arguing for a guy like Because Parker was at one point. Correct. Moises yeah. Alou, you're right. He was never. But, like, a guy like Adrian Beltre, in all honesty, he was, he was never a top five hitter in the league. Mm -hmm. He just played for 20 years and was a very good hitter for 20 years. Now, so that is a guy that hit 3,000 hits correct. and 500 bombs. But until he – End he, of discussion. 400 home runs, not 500. Uh, 400. But uh, 3,000 hits. But, like, until he hit that number, people didn't – until he was hitting in his 40s, 
late 30s. People didn't realize how great Adrian You're right. Beltre that's was fair. to that, the very that's end. That's fair. To the very end. Because a lot of us are old enough to remember when he came up with the Dodgers he and he hits 48 home runs, home runs right. knocks in 121 in 2004. He signs as a free agent to go to the biggest ballpark in baseball, Seattle. They had just opened that park. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, he had some good years. A hell of a lot better than Maurer. I mean, he had 19 homers, <laughs> knocked in 87. He had 25 home runs, knocked in 89. You know, anyway, and, and was, it, 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 but then when he went to Texas is when everything changed. Because Correct. He was he, at the end of his career. He and, had the one big year in Boston, and then he, here he comes now. And, I mean, from 2011 to 2000, really in 16, those six, that six-year run, I mean, it, 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 it was off the charts. Until that point, though, no one thought of him as an elite of no. elite player. It was when he started doing it in his late 30s that people started True. recognizing it. So, yeah, like when you talk about, like, peaks and stuff like that, this is why an argument for a guy like Andrew Jones. Andrew Jones, if you look up defensive metrics, has, is one of the greatest defenders yep. of all time. From, like, 1995 to 2005, there might not have been a better three players in the league, and the two players that were better than them was Barry Bonds and Alex Rodriguez, who were roided up in, in, in playing the greatest baseball that the world has seen at that point. Yep. So that's why people argue for guys like uh, Andrew Jones, and he, he's a fun introspective. But you keep talking about Joe Maurer and comparing him to these outfielder stats. You can't compare Johnny Bench's stats to Barry Bonds and Hank Aaron's listen, stats. Listen, listen, listen. I am comparing when you actually have a chance to put somebody in the Hall of Fame. Do they deserve to be in? And based strictly on numbers, and I don't care what position they play. This is a human being who's being voted upon based on his career, and has he earned the right to be in baseball's Hall of Fame? Is his greatness just above and beyond what you would normally put in there. And there is no way, there's no way, that I can look at Gary Sheffield's numbers I and I can say that yeah. a guy should be in that has not even knocked in 950 runs and he had 140 home runs. There's no way. There's just no way. The other guy hit 509 home runs. He knocked in 17 home 1,600 runs. I mean, no. Listen, I think, I think, no, I think no chance. Gary Sheffield should be in. I just think you guys, I think you, you are not properly grading catchers on being the worst offensive output from a position on the field. There's a reason, and, and, and I would argue when you were asking the question, would you rather have a guy like Gary Sheffield or have a guy like Joe Maurer? When you have a catcher that is a great hitter, MVP caliber player like Joe Maurer was playing catcher, that is a luxury that very few teams in the league have. True. I mean, how many positions? I think. But he didn't do that year after year won, after year. In three, in a three, in a four-year span, he finished sixth in the MVP, fourth in the MVP. He won an MVP and eighth in the MVP. Three-year span. Four year span. Four year span I'm talking where he about, led the American League in batting average. Okay. Where he won an MVP, Silver Slugger, Gold Glove. Yep. And, and then he, what about the other four years outside of that? He barely got on the field. He didn't hit for any power. He didn't drive in any runs. So are you telling me that Joe Maurer's going in the Hall of Fame based on a four year run? I I think Joe Maurer deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. I think he's he's one of the best catchers of that generation. Right, and in fact, I don't know if there's a better catcher from 2005 to 2010 than Joe Maurer. He's by, he, Nick, Nick says if you went by positions, didn't matter. Barry Larkin should probably, of course, Barry Larkin would be a Hall of Famer. Well, the reason he's in is is because he was a shortstop. He's one of the best shortstops. He was one of again, was one of those guys where if you watched him every day, the eye test would tell you this guy was a Hall of Famer, and it's not even debatable. Leader, captain, winner, nut cut in time. What did he do? MVP, stole bases, great defender, good arm, could do everything to beat you in a single game, gave up himself for ground balls to the right side of the infield to get to a runner at third. That guy, I test. I test. Not some war, I test. 
Hall of Famer. And look, maybe people who watch Joe Maurer, I watched him a ton. I did a lot of Minnesota games through the years. Barry, but I had seen him by the time he had had so many concussions, and God bless him. He had had so many concussions as a catcher that they had to move him uh, over to first base. You ready for this? You, 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 keep, you keep ripping on Joe Maurer not having 1,000 RBIs. He has almost the exact same amount of RBIs as Barry Larkin. Barry Larkin didn't get over 1,000 RBIs. Barry Larkin spent most of his career batting first or second on his team. That Uh, is a ridiculous notion. They are totally different players. Where did Joe Maurer bat? He batted third on every one of those teams. He batted two-hole for the the, – because Justin Morneau was behind him. Mark Mark Teixeira wasn't there, but Justin Morneau batted three-hole, right? I think you could go 3-4-2-3 on any given day. They were totally different players. Larkin stole 300 and something more bases than Joe Maurer. He was a totally different player. I mean, that's like comparing Barry Larkin to, I mean, pick somebody else. I mean, there's no, their style of play it was so totally different and what their teams asked them to be. Mauer batted third, 1,093 games. He batted second, 270. Okay, so I was wrong there. Three-hole hitter in a career hits 143 home runs. In the arguably single two biggest band boxes in the American League. The Metrodome and the New Stadium. Which I don't know if he actually ever played there. Not now that I think about it, he did. Played his entire career in the Metrodome. All I'm saying is, is as a catcher, which once again, I, as, Joe, as Nick Kirby alluded to positions matter it's why it, like if, if Barry Larkin was an outfielder we wouldn't even be having this conversation that he's a hall of famer it's because he played shortstop and played that's that's a that is a position that lacks in power output it's not like first base it's not like corner outfield similar to catcher in a thousand more at bats Barry Larkin had 40 more home runs had a lower batting average had a lower on base percentage had a very similar slugging percentage they were both good defensive players they were both good hitters like the, the, Joe Maurer is a Hall of Fame player, Tom. He is. I, I'm waiting for you to tell me outside of a four-year run, I'm waiting for you to tell me what makes him a Hall of Famer. He outside two- of those four years, because you can't tell me about numbers unless you're going to play this, 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 this pick-the-catcher position thing. Because you cannot argue with me on numbers. Okay, you can tell me he had a 300 career bat. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I'll give him that. 306, whatever it was. Okay, you like the fact that he took walks and he had a high on base percentage? Okay, that's fine. But, it, but, but, but when you start breaking down the numbers. And I'm looking at him. I know. And you're telling me a guy who knocked in, who could never play more than 138 games in a year, except for one time. You're telling, and, and, and who never one time, one time in his career, He hit more than 13 home runs. One time, he hit more than 13. One time, he knocked in more than 80 runs. One time, he did those things in his career. Now, the 365 batting average in a given year, hey, man, unbelievable. But, I mean, come on. You're telling me that's a Hall of Famer? I'm I'm looking at his numbers compared to Barry Larkin, and they're incredibly similar. I'm not talking about Barry Larkin. I'm talking about Joe Maurer. And I'm telling you, Barry Larkin's in the Hall of Fame, and Joe Maurer, as a catcher, has similar numbers despite playing in 1,000 less at-bats. He has 2,100 hits. Barry Larkin has 2,300 hits. He has 140 home runs. Barry Larkin has 190 home runs. 960 RBIs for Barry Larkin, 940 for Joe Maurer. Oh, and he had a higher batting average, had a higher on base yep. percentage, similar slugging percentage. Not to mention they have they both have an MVP. Barry Larkin never led the league in anything. Joe Maurer over over that stretch where he was one of the greatest. He hitters led the, in league the league in one thing, being a World Series champion. It's true. It's he led the league in one thing, being the captain and the best player on a World Series champion. So he has that in his hip pocket. Okay. All right, look, again, I don't want to sit here and come across. We're not going to sit here and come across. I don't want to be that guy uh, that is sitting here arguing that Joe Maurer doesn't belong at a Hall of Fame. I'm just saying I don't think he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. And I think it would be an insult to many 
great players who are left out of this game and out or out of this Hall of Fame that if Mauer is a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean, you want to put him in the, year, in the next year, year after year after year? I mean, go ahead. That's fine. I mean, I could make the argument. You made Todd Wel- Helton wait around for six, seven years. And if you want to stack up his numbers over the long haul, I'm just saying, not a four-year stretch. I'm talking eight, 10, 12-year stretch of knocking the cover off the ball. And I don't want to hear about the Colorado thing. He played half his games on the road, too. And the guy still knocked the cover off the ball. If you want to talk about stretches of dominance at your position during a decade or a dozen years, Helton was a more dominant force for the longer period of time at his position in his league than Nat Bauer was at his position in his league. In the history of Major League Baseball, Tom, a catcher has won the batting title three times. All three were done by Joe Maurer. That's awesome. That's awesome. And like I said, I'm, I, and I'm I not, have and once no again, doubt you, you he keep, belongs you keep compa- in the Hall of Fame. You keep, you keep throwing Todd Helton's numbers compared to Joe Maurer's, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to explain to you that your position matters. Todd Helton was a first baseman. You should compare Joe, Todd Helton's numbers to guys like Lou Gehrig. Like, your position matters. I am just talking about the first ballot because in baseball, that is a big deal for guys. The people who follow the sport, a first ballot is, is something extremely rare and unique. That's true. And, and like I said, I, it is. That's the point Joe, I'm making through all of this. Joe, we'll come 6, 6 p.m. tonight, we'll find out that Joe Maurer is probably not going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Sir Boy Wonder wants I'll be to know. i shocked if he is. Is Dielsen. A first ballot <laughs> Hall of Famer. Dilson, Dilson, You know what? Well, we didn't spend any time uh, on the UC game today. We got all wrapped up. Well, I certainly hope, you know what's amazing to me, is all I do on this chat every day is read, uh, is read Brian B. and a bunch of other guys complain, 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 complain that we don't talk enough about baseball. I mean, it happens every single day. Despite the fact, I might argue, that since we went today from talking about football and what our numbers look like compared to talking about baseball and what our numbers look like are night and day. So if we're trying to build this show and be successful, it would almost border on ironic or lunacy to even ever talk about baseball. Because the numbers, as I say, just like the Hall of Fame, the numbers do not lie. When we talk about football and even talk about the Chiefs and the Bills, our numbers are up here. The second we start talking about baseball and who goes into the Hall of Fame, they're down here. I think it's about the eye test on this one. Uh, Yeah, the the, the UC game. Sir Boy says, do I hate baseball? Sir Boy, come on. We're trying to build a successful show here. Do you think, Tom, one more thing I'll do in defense of Joe Maurer because I love, I love talking this with you. Joe Maurer, Hall of, I'm just comparing him to other catchers that have been inducted. Gary Carter, one of the best catchers ever, right? It was fantastic. He's in the Hall of Fame. Joe Maurer has more hits, has a higher slugging percentage, has a higher on-base percentage, has a higher batting average. All these things. Okay, and you're also, now, you, again, you're picking and choosing here. You're picking and choosing, again, you, you, you want to talk about on base percentage. You, <laughs> you want to you talk about whatever these other things. You, where are they in home runs? Where are they in okay, runs? Okay, so, so, so what, what stat? Where are they there? What, what no, stat, I'm just saying you stat, can't pick and stat? choose what you want to pick. You, you're picking home Give runs. Give me everything. You're picking home runs. No, I'm just what saying, stat what are the difference in those a, numbers? As a power hitter. What are the difference in those numbers? What's, what stat What illustrates... are the difference in those numbers? Okay, Gary Carter hit 324 home runs. 324 compared to one what? 43. Okay, so, so, so Tom, okay. you're talking power. Okay. What stat signifies your power numbers? Slugging percentage, right? Slugging percentage de- denominates how many bases, de- depending on how many times you go to well, the Well, I mean, power can be defined in different ways. Slugging percentage includes doubles, triples, which neither one of those guys were triples guys, right? Who but had more doubles? Who hit more doubles in his career? Gary Carter hit uh, approximately 371 doubles. 
Uh, Joe Maurer hit 428. Okay. So what I'm saying is when you ask me, I would bet the ranch, and obviously it has to be. You're be- basically, you're betting the ranch here on, on if you're asking me who is a better power hitter in their career between well, Joe asking- Maurer and Gary Carter, that's like asking the difference between black and white. Well, they have the same exact slugging percentage, 439. Again, but you're talking about, That's the I don't stat. necessarily, it might be the stat, but it doesn't mean that there aren't flaws in the stat. There, doubles don't, to me, it's great to have a player who gets a lot of doubles. I would love to have that guy who gets a lot of doubles. I right. love those kinds of hitters. Right. Okay? But it was basically a wash in the doubles category, but it's yeah. like here and here in the home run category. So if those two things are true, if you have a guy that the double spread is like here and the homer spread is like here, you're going to put all your eggs in a basket that that makes Joe ba- Bauer because of slugging percentage a better power hitter well, than one, Gary one, Carter? When it comes to slugging percentage, one home run is worth two doubles. One home run is worth four singles. And, and I'm they saying still the, have the only same reason percentage. Bauer's numbers are better is because of the doubles. He had, over the course of 1,000 less at-bats, he had 60 more doubles. There was no contest on who was one home run. He's got three times as many home runs, and one home run is worth two doubles, Tom. I understand that. I get it. But this is, I mean, again, nobody was around. I'm the only one in the room that was around. Doesn't make me right, but I'm the only one that was around that if you were to pose two people who are old enough to remember who was a better power hitter, they'd say Gary Carter hit 300 and what? Gary Carter batted 262. No, I said how many home runs? Oh, 324 home runs. Three, oh, so he home, hit almost 200 more home runs than yep. Joe Maurer hit. And, and how, many, how many runs batted in? He had uh, 1,200. 1,200. Maurer had 900. 900. Okay. All right. We'll leave this be for the time. Being. <laughs> so, uh, Cherry on top. Hey, Casey, is, can I request that call I showed us yesterday? I want to hear Tom's reaction to this basketball call that I showed yesterday on Box Lunch. I think he's really going to like it. I want to uh, hear it. And this is, this is going to be our cherry on top, uh, and that was, their, that was Reed's case to uh, have Joe Maurer in the Hall of Fame, first ballot. Um, I don't know who won, but you guys can decide in the chat right now who, won, I, who no, won that. There's nothing I, get, I love more than talking about the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, sports talk. And, I, Tom, I think you're really going to like All right, let's this. hear this. So this is between some scrub teams and God knows where. It's, okay. you gotta, it's two high schools. You gotta listen, two you gotta, very big high schools. You've got to you gotta listen, you listen to this call, Tom. <laughs> two scrubs. Jet Kenny guarding down low in the steal. I can see a big Sam one. Freeney. Wow! It. Oh, oh my God! Sit down, little boy. Let the man fly. I don't care about the technical. He is up in the sky, sending it down, big man. Sam Freeney. Boom, 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 boom. That's a body. <laughs> put him in the sky and let him fly. That is big time. Put it. Put him in the sky and let it fly, Tom. <laughs> that's better than anything I ever had, brother. <laughs> I mean, that is big. T- See, I love that stuff because that's a high school guy. You're right. Yeah. It's a high school. Right? I mean, it's a high school guy. Yeah. I love that stuff because I'm going to tell you right now, my son had a chance to do this in the basketball games, and those kids, that kid that dunked the ball, mm-hmm. that will be the highlight maybe of his life. I don't know if he's going to be a college basketball player a lot, but that call right there, it's all they're talking about. Mm-hmm. It, it's cool. We, Chatterbox used to do a lot more high school games than we do now, but it would always be cool when you just be scrolling Twitter and you see these kids tweeting out their highlights and it's from, like, us calling That's games. Right. That's like, right. It'd be really cool to see that. The one the kid from Moeller when he had the touchdown uh, oh, yeah. a couple years ago. The little remember. kid. Little, little yeah. running back. Great, great lacrosse player. Flipped God, into great the end zone. Great football player, too. Yeah, flipped in the end zone. It was great stuff. All right, Casey. Thanks for keeping us online here today. A little fired up. Lindsay, I apologize. Oh, man. It's totally fine. You know, old dudes it. can be passionate dudes, too. Casey, you know that? Oh, yeah. You know we, I mean? we get passionate in here. Uh, well, why not? Why not? Uh, gentlemen, good stuff today. God bless. bless. A lot of fun. Uh, we got to figure out what we're doing tomorrow because my dad is normally on tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk about the Xavier game tomorrow. Forgive us for not talking about the UC game from last night. We might talk about UC we, game tomorrow. We can get into that tomorrow um, and, uh, and go from there. So every uh, – today's Tuesday. So no, any uh, programming notes, Casey, I need to be aware of? Nick, have anything coming up? So we do have a members-only live stream, stream for yep. the Madden thing. I plan on actually maybe clipping that up and maybe posting it. For, Sounds good. For everyone to see, just the little highlights and bits of it. Uh, other than that, if any breaking news happens – 
for the Bengals. Me and Reed will be going live at some point for that. So stay tuned for any um, upcoming news. And um, I don't think there's anything else. Okay, so. we'll see you tomorrow. Well, that's we'll what everybody's going to be watching, the, uh, the whole uh, Dan Pitcher thing today. We'll see how it goes. Talk about it again tomorrow. Thanks to our guests today, Brian Billick, Marty Brenneman, and Charlie Goldsmith. Thanks to all of you for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow.